So 20 years since the creation of the International Space Station, a very important spacewalk was scheduled for March 2019. There had been 214 spacewalks preceding this one. So what made it special? The 214 before this one were all male only or mixed male female teams. The one scheduled for March 2019 was a all, the first all female spacewalk, which would be a moment written down in history books for centuries to come. Unfortunately, it was delayed, not because of rocket malfunctions or health issues of the women. Instead, this historical moment was delayed simply because there weren't enough astronaut suits to fit the women's bodies. Gender and sex impacts every facet of our lives from misdesigned computer mice contributing to higher rates of carpal tunnel in women to boots not considering differences in female joint anatomy. Many of you have likely heard of the wage gap or the lack of females in leadership positions. And yes, those are incredibly important issues. But today we're gonna to be talking about the effects of those issues. The effects of thousands of years of discrimination against women. Products, policies, and protocols all need to be systematically designed with considerations of gender and sex in mind. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the impact of gender and sex on COVID-19 and healthcare in general, because looking at health through this lens is not just an issue for women's health, it's a societal health issue. So quickly, I would like to introduce myself. Um, hi, my name is John V. I am a rising senior from Market High School in Chesterfield, Missouri. Um, in terms of long-term career plans, I hope to enter the field of women's health and eventually be involved in policymaking to help dismantle the dangers of male-centric medicine. So an important distinction I want to make at the beginning is that between the, dif the differences between sex and gender. So according to the definitions provided by the National Academy of Medicine, sex is solely dependent on one's genes. So typically, their individuals will either have XY or XX chromosomes being male or female, respectively. And these are the two sexes. But sometimes there are individuals that do not have the reproductive or sexual anatomy um, matching traditional ideas of male and female. And these individuals are known as intersex. So sometimes, depending on the source, intersex individuals can be considered a third um, sex. On the other hand, gender is based on a person's self-representation and is highly dependent on social interactions, epigenetics, biology, a whole host of factors. So currently, there are over 50 labels for an individual's gender identity and some simply prefer not to have a label at all. So today when I talk about the sex and gender lens and looking at the world through this lens, understand that it is truly a non-binary approach and we wanna consider both sex and gender in the design of products, policies, et cetera. So this is where the nonprofit work I do with the nonprofit iGiant comes in and it is really pioneering this gender and sex lens that I will continue expanding on in today's presentation. So to provide a very tangible example, um, in healthcare, I'm going to provide the example of this, this male and this female. Everything about them is the same. Age, socioeconomic status, race, everything. The only difference is one's a female and one is a male. So disease, diseases like heart attacks present in both of these individuals vastly differently. In males, it's more likely that they have a crushing pressure in the chest, uh, known as angina, whereas in women, something known as atypical symptoms or more common, which could include slight discomfort to simply no symptoms at all. So in this way, disease presents differently, but also its pathophysiology is widely different. In males, um, heart attacks are more likely to be the result of arthroscerotic blockages in large vessels in the heart, which cause sudden ruptures of these blood vessels. Whereas in women, it's more likely that these blockages are found in tiny vessels and slowly erode away at the vessel wall. So disease presentation and disease pathophysiology are highly gendered, yet not enough attention is given to this gendered component, and this can often lead to incorrect diagnoses or incorrect treatments, which obviously compromises the efficiency and the um, adequacy of healthcare. Similarly, prevalence rates are highly dependent on gender and sex. Uh, for example, certain diseases like autoimmune conditions, um, like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis are more common in women, versus cardiovascular conditions are more common in men. And this trend is consistent across every and all aspects of healthcare. We could talk about the lack of surgical tools being designed for a woman's grip. We could talk about the lack of properly fitted scrubs or the overwhelming dominance of men in fields like surgery. So in essence, gender and sex impacts every single facet of healthcare. So now I'd like to share a fact with you. 
men are more likely to die, almost twice as likely to die of COVID-19, even if women are more likely to get infected. Um, I'm gonna repeat that. Men are more likely to die of COVID-19, even if women are more likely to get infected. It is frightening to think about the limited amount of attention given to this incredibly significant piece of information. So why is this and why do we need to consider gender and sex in our next steps towards COVID-19? So in the process of creating effective therapeutics, including treatments and vaccines, we must consider gender and sex in terms of drug development and dosages. So women are known to have a more robust immune system. The exact cause is multifactorial, but um, one of the roles is of the X chromosome and, and, and its immunomodulatory function. So since women mount more aggressive immune responses, that makes them more effective at dealing with conditions like COVID-19, but also increases the risk of having a more active, overactive immune system, like which can cause autoimmune conditions or a phenomenon known as cytokine storms, which ultimately can be fatal. Additionally, testosterone is known to have an immunosuppressive effect, while progesterone and estrogen, the female sex hormones, have been known to have the opposite effect and actually stimulate the immune system. There are even clinical trials, very few, but there are a couple that are capitalizing on this fact and seeing if progesterone can be used as a treatment in men with confirmed COVID-19. Uh, finally, men are more likely to drink or smoke, which can contribute to higher rates of COVID-19 um, comorbidities, which can contribute to the mortality. So the combination of these three factors, men having a less robust immune system, the immunosuppressive effect of testosterone, and general just gender trends for risk factors and other risk, risky behaviors contributes to the higher rate of mortality in men. So, and then in terms of why women are more likely to get infected is because over 70% of the healthcare workforce in almost every country, including the United States, is made up of women. So their exposure to this disease, you know, directly is very, very high. So in terms of why we need to consider this, if women mount more aggressive immune responses, it is a very strong possibility that we could give women lower dosage of vaccines and therapeutics and could end up saving us millions of dollars and just millions of resources amidst this global pandemic. Another important factor to consider is personal protective equipment. So according to a United Kingdom survey, only 29% of women reported using personal protective equipment specifically designed for them. So facial structure and facial anthropomorphic differences are highly dependent on sex and gender. And we need to look at sex and make sure we have properly designed masks that fit correctly as well to protect our female healthcare workers and essential workers. Because like I mentioned, they make up over 70% of our healthcare workforce. And if we don't consider sex and gender the design of masks and PPE in general, we will only actually continue the spread of this horrible disease. So evidently, there are numerous ways that gender and sex impact the way that we should think about healthcare and simply the world in general. A one-size-fits-all mentality can be extremely dangerous. Without the considerations of individual needs and history, the overall quality of healthcare is threatened. Another dangerous mentality is that of the pink it and shrink it approach. So oftentimes when companies want to make a product for a woman, they take a men's product, make it smaller, make it pink, and then raise the price. But this is not what we mean. Instead, we need thorough research into the biological and behavioral gender differences. And then we need to take time to systematically design products, policies, protocols to meet safe and equitable standards. This is where my work with my nonprofit comes in. Through my nonprofit, I've had the ability to host and organize roundtable conferences, summits, and challenges, reaching new audiences and spreading this message to new people like yourselves today. I'm also part of an amazing team writing a paper for the Journal of Women's Health about the gender and sex considerations of COVID-19 in the spheres of healthcare, retail, IT, and transportation. So that's what I'm doing. What are you going to do? What is your call to action? Over the past couple of days, um, I've been able to hear some really fascinating presentations um, from those about malaria, to the opioid crisis, to diabetes, to Alzheimer's. All of them can and should be looked at through this gender and sex lens. So I encourage you to do research about the topics that you are passionate about and see how gender and sex impacts them. The first step is even knowing that there's a problem. And after today's presentation, you know there's a problem. And hopefully you all can take action so that we can live in a community and have a healthcare system that recognizes gender specific differences without weaponizing them as a means of discrimination. I wanted to end on a note that one of my mentors says, and she says that hopefully we can take the next steps in boots that fit us. Um, thank you so much. Here are my references. 
I would like to acknowledge um, Dr. Mark, who is my mentor, for her incredible advice and guidance over the past year and a couple of months. Um, I would like to thank the Global Health Leaders Conference team for this wonderful opportunity and all the time you guys have put into giving us this opportunity. And then I would like to thank all of you for listening and applying this lens to every facet of your lives. And I can talk about this forever and ever. So if you have any questions or thoughts, I would love to hear them. So please email me. Um, once again, thank you so much.